Hey guys, welcome to my channel, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. Parents can be very intrusive, arrogant, and demanding in their demands. Sometimes it brings some benefit, and sometimes it does not. There are times when this demanding is even dangerous. Brett Ryan was in just such a situation. He grew up in a prosperous and large Canadian family where his parents, Bill and Susan, had four sons. It might seem that having so many children, and especially boys, is hard and exhausting parenting labor. But it wasn't for everyone. Their parents tried to teach the younger Ryans by example. Their father, in addition to his prestigious job at the Toronto Star Daily Newspaper, had many hobbies, such as sports, yoga, and psychology. And as for Susan, she was very hardworking, and the whole family home rested on her shoulders. She not only gave her time to her husband and children, but also kept a huge house in a prestigious area of Toronto in perfect condition, and all this, without the help of gardeners and craftsmen, neighbors passing by the family home, for a while lingered to admire the huge and blooming garden through the fence. It could not be said that Brett was the family favorite. No, Suzanne loved everyone equally, but from the outside, it might have seemed that it was Brett who was scolded least of all for obedience. The thing was, he could always get out of any situation. Even when all the evidence pointed to his involvement, he found a way to prove that he was only partially involved. And amazingly, that ability helped him have a lot of friends. Yeah, Brett was pretty damn popular at school. Everyone wanted to be friends with him, or at least be able to say hello by the hand. Just like his older brothers, Brett went to university after high school. Brett always wanted to be better than his brothers, so he took out an ad in the local newspaper offering Toronto residents a service to paint houses and fences. At first things were going really well. The young man had his first money. Susan was even proud of her son and always held him up as an example to others. But it's one thing when this money is a part-time job, and quite another when you drop out of university to spend all your free time breathing in the smell of paint and not having any education. Yes, after a while, Brett dropped out of university. While for the first couple of years, Brett felt confident in front of his older brothers after a while, when Christopher and Leland graduated and found jobs in their specialties, Brett's authority began to fade. Christopher worked for the City of Toronto Transit Commission, and Leland became the family artist and designer. After their studies, they moved out of their parents' home, and Brett, to avoid spending part of his earnings on rent, stayed with his father, mother, and younger brother, who attended a school for gifted children. With each passing year, Brett became more and more desperate. Because of his debts and inability to pay them off, he developed depression. By 2007, when Brett was already 26 years old, his debt had passed $60,000. Brett was considered a pretty smart guy, but he didn't know how to use his mind. At the same time, he did not show how bad he was. He always smiled, helped everyone, was a participant of volunteer movements. No one could believe how big the black hole in his soul was. Finally came that fateful moment when nothing could be done, at least not legally. On October 28, 2007, Brett had no orders for house painting or any other work around the house. Orders are always extremely scarce in the fall. Everyone who wanted to had already painted their houses in the spring or summer. Winter was approaching, from which you should not expect any big earnings. There was no time to wait for anything. Brett put on all the old clothes he had in his closet. A hat, a long sweater he'd gotten from his older brother, a scarf his mother had knitted. The scarf was comically long. Brett hadn't even worn it before, but finally the scarf came in handy. He wrapped it around his face, leaving only a narrow slit for his eyes, and headed for the bank that was on the outskirts of his neighborhood. He was clutching some thick folder and limped playfully on his right foot. Brett waited his turn at the bank, and when he was finally summoned by an employee, he went up to her and told her in a quiet voice that he had a gun with him. He also told her to take all the money out of the bank's cash register and give it to him. Otherwise, he would shoot here, and the first person he would kill would be her. The girl with trembling hands handed him all the cash she had in the cash register, and Brett quietly walked out of the building so as not to attract the attention of the guards. And when he was on the street, he ran away. He counted the money he had stolen. It wasn't very much, a little over a thousand dollars, to pay off his debts, 
he would have to rob about 60 banks. Sounds fantastic, but there was no other way out. For the first few days, the novice robber feared that the police would somehow still be able to get to him, so he did not appear at home. He told his mother that he had an order in a neighboring town, and he himself spent the night in the car. Periodically, Brett crept up to his house to see if there was a police car in the bushes. No, it was quiet. No one was looking for him. That's good. So he's headed in the right direction. The first robbery was followed by a second, third, fourth. Brett changed clothes each time. He didn't wear his old clothes anymore. He bought them secondhand or even found them in the trash. After the crime, he burned the used clothes. Brett also purchased a beard from a store that sold outfits for costume parties. The bank employees he threatened always noticed his beard and later testified that the attacker was a bearded man. Toronto newspapers began publishing a number of articles about the bearded robber. But the bearded robber never made a fortune in robberies. The maximum amount that could be stolen did not exceed $3,000. Finally, Brett had a misfire. The police spotted his car on the surveillance cameras and followed him all the way home. By that time, they still had no direct evidence of his guilt. It was decided to just follow the suspect. It was as if Brett sensed the outside surveillance and did not go on a robbery spree for the next 15 days. Although before that, the intervals between crimes were three or four days. The cops thought they were on the wrong trail and wasting their time suspecting an innocent guy. But finally, luck smiled on them. Brett left the house, got into a car, and later got out of the car not far from the bank, wearing a different, strange outfit. He went into the branch, stayed there for a while, but at the exit, he was met by the police to finally handcuff him and announced that the much-discussed bearded robber had finally been caught. Brett was under investigation for seven months. He was charged with robbery with a firearm. Interestingly, despite having a gun permit, the bearded robber always came to the bank empty-handed. He didn't even have a kitchen knife with him. In total, he was charged with 19 counts and was sent to prison. From there, Brett, just like his family, filed multiple appeals. This yielded results. Only eight of the 19 counts were upheld. But Brett didn't stop there. As soon as he had the opportunity to apply for parole, he took it. In his petition, Brett asked to take into account the fact that he went to these crimes being in a severe depression, caused by two failed relationships, as well as a large amount of debt. At the same time, he once again noted that he went to the crimes without weapons, absolutely not planning to harm anyone. His remarks were accepted, but in order to get out of prison early, he had to undergo a session with a psychologist. The sessions had a positive effect on Brett. All the time he was behind bars, he did not communicate with his family, and now he himself has made a step towards getting closer and restoring relations with his family. The positive changes were noticed by the commissioners, so on November 24, 2010, Brett was released. This freedom, for which the young man fought so zealously, turned out to be very bitter and even harder than it was before. Who was Brett before? A painter with a heavy burden on his soul. What was he now? Brett the bank robber, Brett the ex-con. With such a tainted background, he was never hired by any company. And those who hired him for house painting services, as soon as they recognized him as the bearded robber, refused his services. Also the neighbors, yes, the same ones who used to praise Susan's garden and visit, now began to spread various unpleasant rumors. The whole Ryan family hastily sold the house and moved to Scarborough. Susan started growing her new garden again, and Brett did get a job with a trading company, but his pay was not high. His parents were also helping him with money to rebuild his university education. Brett still visited a psychologist, and each time the specialist advised him the same thing, don't break the connection with your family. The psychologist's advice really worked. Despite this, Brett's financial well-being left much to be desired. In September 2011, the first happy accident in his life happened. He met Kristen Baxter. Kristen was just a fantastic girl. She had her own apartment, the windows of which overlooked the sea thanks to which the young couple opened a beautiful landscape. She was engaged in sports, which allowed her to keep her body in shape. And most importantly, she did not care about Brett's past. They also traveled periodically as a couple and had even been to Australia. Brett's father and mother, watching his relationship with the girl develop, were very happy. 
In addition, they were sure that their son will finally take his head, and Kristen will push him in every possible way to develop and finally take his place in society. Brett felt that life was starting to get better, but there was an unfortunate event that was out of his control and that disrupted the building of a new phase. Brett's father died. For him, it was a real shock. His depressive state began to return, because of which Brett began to visit a psychologist more often. He also had to spend a lot of time with his mother and help her with money, which he already had a little. A long relationship with Kristen had to be developed. Young people were not teenagers, which is enough just to meet and spend free time together. Being madly in love with this enchanting blonde, Brett decided to take a serious step. He had some savings, plus he talked to his mother and said that he wanted to build a family with Kristen. And to do this, he needed to make her an offer that Kristen could not refuse him and remember this day for the rest of her life. Susan realized what her son was getting at and gave him money to buy a ring. It should be noted that the couple had discussed their future before that. And no, Kristen didn't need some expensive gift or something like that. It was enough for her to get a proposal from Brett as a confirmation of his serious intentions. But he still decided to splurge and bought a gold ring with a huge diamond for his beloved. Kristen, of course, told him, yes. Then, as is usually the case, the young people began planning their wedding. Brett agreed with all of Kristen's decisions and nodded approvingly, but he was horrified at how expensive it was and how much he needed to think about his job. He found an engineering job opening for a large technology company on the internet, put together a resume, and responded to it. He even had a successful interview and was accepted. Brett was happy at the time. He immediately excited his fiancée and his mother with this news, from whom he again asked for money to buy himself an expensive suit to wear to work. Once again, his mother did not refuse her son. When the suit was already bought, Brett received a call from the company, saying that they had to refuse him because the security service had found out about his criminal past. For Brett, it was like thunder that broke over him. His mood began to plummet immediately, and he finally gave up. Why waste time on this endless series of interviews, waiting for answers, if in the end, no one wants to hire a criminal, even if corrected? And most importantly, why waste time studying? Brett decided that it would be better to spend the money his mother and older brothers gave him for his university studies on his wedding to Kristen. And so he did. Brett was back in the situation he had recently gotten out of. He didn't tell his family that he had dropped out of university, and most importantly, he didn't tell his counselor. He also didn't tell anyone that he had been turned down for an engineering job. He put on a shirt, tie, suit, and went to paint houses, changing into a change of clothes right on the way, and told his relatives that he was working in an office. In addition, in his social networks, Brett constantly posted various photos from the office, or from some business event, of course, previously downloaded from the internet. And also being near his loved ones, he often pretended as if his phone was ringing and he urgently needed to solve some work issues. He was very skillful at making dust in his eyes, and no one would have thought that Brett was actually a common painter. In September 2016, after a five-year relationship with Kristen, Brett planned to have a wedding. He even agreed to rent an expensive restaurant where it was necessary to pay $100 for each guest. The whole Ryan family was very happy because Brett finally took himself in hand, has a prestigious job, lives in a fancy apartment, and he has a stunning bride. But they had no idea that Brett's lies had gone too far and there was no way to get out of it unscathed. By then, the wedding was only a month away and the event required an investment. Our hero again and again borrowed money from his mother and when he realized that she was no longer able to help him, he literally demanded that she change her job to a better paying one. Also, he planned a bachelor party in August, to which he invited all his friends and brothers. As the fuse of this bombshell began to burn out, Brett still decided to tell his counselor about everything. Brett had been lying to his family for a year about working for a technology company as an engineer. The psychologist was saddened that the guy he'd been leading for so long had gotten off the right track again and said that Brett just needed to come clean to his mother. Brett thought about it for a long time, procrastinated, but eventually did so. His mother was insanely upset because she had spent so long telling everyone what a wonderful son she had. 
She also demanded that Brett tell Kristen everything, because if he kept quiet, she would. She also warned her son that his brothers were already aware of the situation, and they were on her side. Brett couldn't do that. After all, he'd had such a hard time telling his mother the truth, and he couldn't tell Kristen about his lies. Yes, he knew that there was less than a month until the wedding, which wouldn't happen because of his lying. And indeed, it would have been better for Kristen to know everything in advance. But he still kept quiet. It wasn't clear what Brett was counting on. And he also couldn't help thinking that his mother would really tell his fiance everything. And then, the scandal would be unavoidable. Brett flinched every time Kristen's phone rang, and even stopped breathing until he realized that it wasn't his mother calling, but another friend of his future wife, asking her about her wedding plans and giving her advice. Finally, he figured out how to silence his mother permanently. When Brett was convicted of robbery, he was forbidden to use firearms, so the boy decided that the best way to carry out his plan was to use a crossbow. And besides, it's a pretty silent murder weapon. One of his late father's hobbies was crossbow shooting in the garden at Targets. He taught Brett how to shoot too. Yes, he was good at target shooting, except that it was unlikely his late father thought his son would use that skill in such a way. Brett bought the crossbow and arrows at a sporting goods store and hid it behind the construction debris that lay in Susan's garage. At home, he arranged what he thought was an ingenious alibi invention. He tied a spoon to a fan and set the fan itself on a timer. When the timer went off, the fan turned on, and the spoon moved across the computer keyboard, sending pre-prepared comments to YouTube. From the outside, it must have looked like Brett had spent all day at home, watching videos and commenting on them. On the morning of August 25th, Brett dressed up in strange clothes that hid his face, left the house through the back door to avoid the security cameras, and took a train to his parents' house to get rid of anyone who might disrupt his and Kristen's well-being once and for all. Susan was very surprised at her son's unexpected arrival. She had not been feeling well that day. But Brett, despite his mother's condition, once again began to persuade her and even demand not to tell his future wife anything. The mother categorically refused him. Then he began to get angry. And Susan, sensing something wrong, seeing her son's mad eyes, warned him that she had already called Christopher and he was on his way to them. Brett was going crazy. He ran to the garage, got a crossbow, but his anger and adrenaline overflowed him with such force that he couldn't even make a shot. He just bludgeoned his mother with the butt of the gun and finally, to be sure that she was finally dead, he tightened the rope around her neck. After throwing plastic bags over the body, Brett loaded the crossbow with arrows and hid in the bushes waiting for his brother to arrive. After a while, Christopher arrived, started calling for his mother or his brother, but in response was shot in the neck from behind, which caused him to die within a few minutes. The next victim was the youngest brother, Alexander. As it turns out, Susan managed to call him too. He was also shot in the neck, but either the arrow did not go deep or did not hit vital arteries, so Alexander did not die immediately, but began to scream and call for help. All this time, Leland was in the house, sleeping in his room on the second floor, and had no idea of the carnage that was going on in the garage and in the garden, and most importantly, that it was his own brother who was committing the crime. His sleep was disturbed by a scream, and coming downstairs, Leland saw Brett trying to strangle Alexander. A fight broke out between Leland and Brett, and as soon as Leland got the upper hand and managed to push his brother aside, he immediately ran to the neighbors and called the police. Brett stayed in the house. He had nowhere to run. He realized that this was the moment he had completely screwed up his life. There was nothing to do. He took out his phone and wrote Kristen a letter asking her to forgive him. The police arrived at the crime scene and saw a bloody Brett, who was sitting next to his equally bloody but still alive brother Alexander, who would die later, in the hospital. Brett himself asked the policeman to handcuff him and take him to the station, where he would confess to everything. He also said that his mother's body was hidden under packages in the garage, but it was impossible to help her. At the police station, and later at the trial, Brett admitted that he did not want to kill Susan. His plan was only to scare her. Christopher and Alexander, on the other hand, he did plan to kill that day, but as witnesses, and if they hadn't arrived, they would still be alive. Just like almost 10 years ago, 
He tried to justify everything with his depressive state, but it did not soften his sentence. And despite the fact that the judge took into account the fact that Brett confessed to everything himself and did not cause the investigation any trouble, the young man received three life sentences, one for each murder, with the right to get parole in 2041. As for Leland, he's not speaking to reporters, but he's known throughout Toronto as the sole survivor of that carnage. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to the channel and don't forget to click the bell not to miss new stories from around the world. See you soon. Take care.